The Crusade mode is one of the most controversial features of Pathfinder Wrath of the Righteous. Lots of people like it, lots of people hate it, but one thing most of us agree on is that it can be quite unbalanced and confusing. In this video I will try to go through everything I've learned about the Crusade mode and share some insights on how it can be a more fun experience instead of just pure frustration. To understand this mode, it is useful to dig into its history a little bit first. The Crusade has been designed after the popular game series Heroes of Might and Magic. In these games, the player controls castles and purchases buildings to train and upgrade their units and heroes while they are exploring on the world map, gathering precious resources needed for buildings, looting hero items and battling monsters and the enemy factions. The Crusade mode battles are very similar to those in Heroes, yet some design choices differ. And these differences are the exact reason I think the mode fails to be as entertaining as it could be. In Heroes, as your generals get higher level, they acquire strong abilities that really enhance their units, and monster upgrades add significant strength to them as well. Additionally, in Heroes there are no arbitrary limitation on army size. All armies can have up to 8 units, this is the big one, but we will talk about this later in the battle section of the video. In Pathfinder, you're able to choose from various generals who can control your armies. While the first one costs only 500 gold, they get more and more expensive as you keep purchasing new generals. You don't need to worry as generals don't die. They only get a 2 days respawn time when their army loses. For generals, I recommend choosing caster types as magic is heavily favored in this mode, as of now, as of now at least. And the other generals are really just not as useful sadly while healing and destructive magic is going to win most of your battles alone. As you will be leveling your generals, you will be able to choose feats each time they level up. Here I recommend choosing destructive magic, healing or master of maneuvers whenever possible. Magic as I explained is very powerful, you will be able to kill or heal entire stacks of units with no problem and Master of Maneuver will allow your armies to have more units in them and thus allowing better unit variety and more advanced tactics in combat. I personally use 2-3 generals in my campaign. I found this to be a good balance to be able to control the map well without having to go back and forth all the time and experience is shared equally so that they are going to be strong throughout the game and you won't really be losing out on much. For units, there is a lot of variety and I haven't been able to test all of them as you will have to make choices in your campaigns on who you use. So instead, I would like to create categories that exist in the game. There are trainable units that you can buy fairly cheap and generate weekly in your capital. Your buildings are able to buff these units and depending on your choices, they can be very strong. The other type are the mercenaries. They can be bought expensive weekly in, in the changing random mercenary pool and usually have special abilities and niches. Units are also divided into infantry, archers, cavalry, spellcasters, and mythical units. Instead of listing every single unit, I like to categorize them into defensive, offensive, and as I call them, the high number soldiers. I recommend experimenting with these. I tried out all of them and they all have their uses. Play the ones you like. In the end, right now, your buildings and your generals will be the most important anyway. With that, we arrive at an important topic, buildings. I cannot stress enough how important this part of the crusade is. Do not sleep on buildings, your capital and your forts. Each region is affected by the building built there. And additionally, you can boost your weekly unit production, your materials income and the attributes and the stats of your armies. Those stats matter a lot. When it comes to buildings, the most important tip I can give is that buildings and their effects stack. That means if you're allowed to build something more than once, that means their effects will stack and your armies will benefit from having more. I will show two examples I like to use. In Dresden, I like to use only one block to boost my trainable units through their production buildings and auxiliary buildings such as Smithy, arsenal or training grounds to increase their stats. In the other two blocks, I exclusively build holes of strategy or military academies. These buildings each give bonuses to your generals and armies and I found them to be the greatest help in having more fun with your armies in battle. In forts, I always build an inn and a supply market. 
especially supply market for the material income, which is going to be your most important resource when it comes to building in crusade mode. For the remaining slots, I honestly just tend to stack hospitals so that my armies can regenerate in their infirmaries, so you will not be losing a lot of units, or none at all when fighting battles. Each fort can be upgraded into a bigger settlement in the crusade management mode, and you will be able to build more hospitals and teleportation circles that will help you navigate on the map faster. It is not really necessary, but it definitely helps. Otherwise, it would be just boring to move everywhere back and forth. There are three banners in the crusade mode that affects your army's morale. Keeping this morale is important as the, as the lower it gets, it is more likely that your units will run in fear or lose out turns. They are fairly straightforward. One is for defeating armies, one is for capturing forts, and one is for not having any forts under attack. The only thing I would like to recommend here is to make sure you don't waste enemy armies and forts, as right now if you run out of forts and enemies to kill, you won't be able to keep your morale up and all your banners will end up red and there will be nothing for you to do to fix it and, and you will lose your game. Here we are at the most important part of the video, battles. Battles are your standard turn-based mode, so I don't think we need to go into too many basic details, so instead I will focus on some tips. It is very good to have throwaway units in your armies, as the computer likes to tunnel vision on doing as much damage to your units as it can. They prefer to focus units with the lowest armor class and highest health, such as clerics in my experience, probably as they calculate that more health damage is the best. This makes clerics fantastic bait units, Bait units are useful for giving you precious time for either your archers or your general to kill the most dangerous packs of demons while losing only one stack of these bait units. Another valid strategy I like to use is blocking the enemy units from attacking your archers. This won't be available in every battle sadly because of the army limitation I mentioned at the beginning of the video, which is one of the weaknesses of this game mode. In the game that inspired this mode, one of the most popular methods of fighting is creating armies with a big stack of archers and using 7 stacks of throwaway units to block the enemy from attacking your main force. It creates a dynamic and fun tactics in battle, but sadly this army limitation is really just anti-fun in Pathfinder and just makes the crusade a slog or just another numbers game on who has more units. In this battle we're gonna be trying to focus on our bait units. As you can see, for this army, the enemy army is not specifically very strong, but it's going to showcase nonetheless like how the AI and the computer thinks, and we will be able to show if the strategy works. So, uh, in, a, in, in order to show how the, well this works, I'm actually going to throw away my first turn, and we're not going to be using magic. As you can see, uh, the succubus is the, the incubi, actually not the succubus, the incubi is targeting our clerics. So what we're going to do with our bait clerics is just go into defense mode. And as you can see, even though my archers are the obvious choice to go for, uh, they are going for the clerics. Here, the rock might be attacking me, but again, let's skip my turn in order to... Um, to uh, try to show some tactics here. I'm going to be body blocking my archers. This means the rock is now not able to attack my archers. And so we are getting into position. The Glebrizo, of course, continues to go after my clerics. But now if we start attacking, my archers are slowly getting them. And here, because we sacrificed too many clerics while not attacking, this incubi attacked our archer, despite the, uh, the cleric being here, which in these circumstances, sometimes this happens, but more often than not, especially if you have a chance to move the clerics further in the line, the clerics will be holding them up. At this point, this is why healing is so important. You can use a healing and you can see that my infirmary size almost reset completely. Additionally, you can also use Oops, uh, you can also use a uh, cleric healing. I wanted to use it on my archers. So you can see those clerics just held up the Glibrizu very easily. I can still uh, just melee down what attacked my archer after we regenerated. And uh, in order to make sure that this Glibrizu cannot attack my archer here, 
I will be moving the cleric into this position. So there is no free four slot next to the archer. And the archer is still going to be able to deal with this glib reason. As you can see, we basically won this fight while being severely handicapped by not using the archer for two turns and not using magic at all. And we only lost uh, five clerics that we instantly regenerated because simply we used the, the methods the game offered us, which is the infirmary and, and baiting our units. And thus you can pretty much win most battles. For this next battle, I'm going to be showing the idea of throwaway armies and complete throwaway generals in order to defeat enemies where you are afraid that the enemy caster might be uh, might be using fireballs or magic that you can't deal with, or potentially you might have great losses. As you can see, the AI would lose this, but let's see how we're going to deal with this battle. In this battle, we are completely going to be focusing on our uh, caster magic, on our general's powers. We don't even care to do anything with our units. You can see we're full of throwaway units, and every turn we will be able to use some magic. And since I said magic is just absolutely uh, broken in the game, and even though this unit could be, you know, a thousand infantry normally that was just mind controlled by this Lilithu, but since this is a throwaway army, we really don't have to worry about that. And while the AI is just uh, messing around here, we're barely losing anything. And we are able to slowly deal with their forces. One tip I can give is that you can freely ignore summoned creatures in battles. Summoned creatures don't really count when it comes to victory and defeat. And if, they, if you just defeat the summoner, you will be winning. The summoned unit will not disappear. But if there are no more enemy units on the map, then you will be victorious. As you can see, our infirmary has more than enough size. We still have five bait units. We're not even close to, uh, to running out of bait units. And slowly, our general is winning the battle and we still have so much energy that we don't have to worry about any of this. And this makes, you see this is even using magic. And this makes bait armies so, so superior, uh, especially with a good general, that um, you will be able to defeat most of the game this way. I mentioned earlier that losing battles is not a big deal. The only thing you lose are your units, and that can hurt, but you will be able to recruit your hero again in two days for free. Why is this good? That means we can not only create throwaway units, but also throwaway armies. This is a fantastic strategy on the world map to weaken bigger demon armies by attacking them with throwaway armies and using your general's magic to kill the strongest demons in the army, just to crush them with your main forces right after. Like this, you will be able to attack a single demon army with two or three or three two or three armies, and you will be able to De destroy the most dangerous demon armies in the map without losing any units or anything really important apart from waiting for your generals to respawn. For closing words, I would definitely recommend not using Oto Crusade mode as you will be losing on some fun lore, but most importantly, you will be losing out on all the relic items that Wrath of the Righteous offers. And these items offer the greatest freedom and replayability for the game and create different fun builds for your characters. Remember, each of these relics are two or three potential items that you can choose from for your character, and they usually have irreplaceable and very unique stats or special effects that you can use on your characters. And as I said, they are so good that you can build a whole playthrough on them. Our question of the day is, have you played the Heroes of Might and Magic series? If yes, Share your fond memories and which one is your favorite. I would love to see them. Good night, everyone.